So last time we were talking about astrotheology. Yep. And the major thing that uh, I think we learned is that the Bible, Christianity, the Torah, all these diff everything, it's all just a story. That's it. So once you understand that it's all just a story, then it all starts to make sense. That's right. Well, once you uh, once you finally realize that, then if you've got any sense, you would say, okay, then what was the story then? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you what the story was. Hmm. The story in the Bible, the story of Jesus in the New Testament, can be boiled down to, and believe me, it's going to take about four hours for me to lay out all of the proof of what I'm saying. I can prove every word I'm saying. But let me give you the bottom line, and then don't hang up on me. Just listen. Because immediately, most people go, oh, that's a bunch of bull. I don't want to hear this. Well, then you will miss something. The bottom line on Christianity, the teachings of Christ, of the teaching of the world, and the whole story about Jesus in the New Testament, is actually very simple. It was so simple, no one saw it. Because it's right there in front of you. The bottom line story in the New Testament story of Jesus is this. A war between light and darkness. Simple. That's it. Night and day. That's exactly right. Day and night. That's right. The war between light and darkness. There are 12 hours of light in which man is happy because he can rule the world and he can grow plants and he can be in charge of the earth and he can build buildings and he can do wonderful things because it's warm out and the, the, and the, the, the weather is nice and it's very warm and he's in charge. He can see everything because his eyes are fixed to, to see things in the light. So he's learning great things, doing great things, having a ball, being human in the light. But when it gets dark, it gets cold and freezing cold at night. The boogeyman comes out. Uh, all these demons and devils and all these evil things come out at night. The boogeyman's going to get you. Who is scared of the dark as children. So there's always been a war. The ancient, ancient peoples. Thousands and thousands of years before the Roman Empire ever existed. Thousands of years before even the Grecian Empire existed. The ancient peoples of the world realized there's a war going on in heaven between light and darkness. So you have 12 hours of light. Thank God we got light. We got warmth. We got the sunlight. And everything is wonderful because we're in control. Humans are in control. But at night, that's when the predator animals come out. That's when the lions come out to eat. That's when the animals come out. All the, the predator animals around the world, the dogs, the animals, they ro and the animals on the Serengeti Plains of Africa, the animals come out at night. And they're coming out to eat. So therefore, during the daytime, when it's nice and warm out in sunlight, you might want to start building a house and building a fire. Because at 6.30, the sun's going down, and the animals are coming out to eat. So if you want to protect your wife and your children, you better build something around you tonight. Because the lions are coming out tonight. The animals are coming out. So you better prepare yourself for the prince of darkness. And so therefore, there's a war on the earth between light and darkness between wonderful light of life and the horrible darkness of the Prince of Darkness. And so there's a war going on between light and darkness. That's the basis for the New Testament story of Jesus. Now, Jesus in the story represents a metaphor. In this understanding, Jesus is not an actual man who actually lived. But Jesus is a metaphor, a symbolic player in the story. Therefore, Jesus represents, he said, the Bible has Jesus saying, I am the truth and the light. And nobody comes to God unless he comes through me. I am the truth and the light, and no man comes to the Father unless he comes through me. So therefore, Jesus has now established himself symbolically 
as representing in the story the truth and the light. Therefore, his opposer, the one who is the evil one, is called the prince of darkness. Therefore, the devil is always, uh, is always appropriately the prince of darkness. Why? Because evil things happen in the dark. Murder happens at night. People get drunk. There were killings. There are all kinds of horrible things happen at night in the cover of darkness. So that uh, when you get into all the occult stuff going on with child sacrifice, all those are works of darkness. Because people who are enlightened don't do those kind of things. So, therefore, the works of darkness are evil. Obviously, they're evil. Well, take a D, the letter D, and put it in front of the word evil. It becomes devil. <laughs> and take an O out of the word good and becomes God. God is good and devil is evil. We're talking words here concepts. The devil is the prince of darkness, while Jesus is the truth and the light. Therefore, the whole story of Christianity, and I'm going to go through about four hours of it, <laughs> but the basic story is that the truth and the light, Jesus, is doing battle with his evil brother, evil, with a D in front of it, becomes devil. <laughs> And so the devil is the prince of darkness, and Jesus is the, tr is the truth and the light. Therefore, the whole story of Christianity is what happens to the truth and the light in this world. What happens to the truth and the light in this world that we live in? Well, first of all, it's laughed at, it's spit on, it's nailed to a cross, it's, uh, it's arrested, is trampled on, spit on. Nobody wants anything to do with him. And he's outcast. And he's hated. That's what exactly true. The truth and the light is spit on, laughed at, mocked. Nobody wants to hear the truth. You know, like like uh, like the movie star. You know, uh, what was his name? Who said? Uh, um, the, the officer in the military, when the kid... You can't handle the truth! Yeah, that's Nicholson. it. So he asked, he asked Tom Cruise, you know, the, the older guy asked Tom Cruise, you know, what do you want from me, son? And he said, I want the truth. He said, you can't handle the truth. You ain't man enough to handle the truth. You want to have the real truth? I'll tell you the real truth. And so that's why, let's see how big a man you are. You want to hear the real truth? I'll tell you what the real truth is. The whole idea is that there's a war between the truth and the light. Jesus said, I am the truth and the light. And his great enemy was his evil brother. Evil, with a D, devil. So therefore the devil was the prince of darkness. And he's doing battle with the prince of light, the truth and the light. So the bottom line on Christianity is what happens to the truth and the light in this world. So whatever Jesus said in the Bible, that's what the truth and the light would say. But whatever happened to Jesus, well, that's what happens to the truth and the light. Whatever, wherever, the, uh, wherever Jesus went, well, that's where the truth and the light went. Well, what happened to the truth and the light when it got there? Well, that's what happened to the truth and the light when you see what happened to Jesus. And so when you begin to see there's a correlation between the truth and the light doing battle with the devil or evil. Now, the truth and the light is referred to as God's son. Well, that's what Jesus is called, God's son. Why? It's because the son, S-U-N, is the light of the world. And, well, of course, Jesus is referred to as the light of the world. He said, I am Jesus, I am the light of the world. And so we call him God's Son. S-U-N. God's Son. Since nobody owns the Son. China doesn't own it, Africa doesn't own it, and we think we own the whole goddamn universe in America, but we don't even own the Son. So since we don't own the sun and nobody else on the earth owns the sun, then who owns the sun? That comes up every morning. Who owns it? 
Well, logic alone would tell you it must be God, because ain't nobody on the earth owns it, so it must be God. I don't know. So it's God's son. Well, that's what we call Jesus, God's son. And we say that Jesus is the light of the world. Well, of course the Son is the light of the world. What else lights the world if it's not the Son? So, God's Son is our risen Savior. Of course the Son, S-U-N, is your risen Savior. Every morning about 5.30, he rises. And it is your risen Savior. Because if the thing don't come up, we're dead in three weeks. Right? What is this earth going to be like with no sun? We know in winter, when the sun goes south, we're freezing. Wait till there is no sun. There is no heat in our solar system, period. The sun's gone. We're going to freeze over big time real quick. So therefore, you better hope that sun comes up every morning at 530, because he is the hope of the world. He is the light of the world. Now, not only does the sun represent warmth and represents life and light so that you can actually see instead of rumbling around in the dark for the rest of your life, you know, you can actually see things you're doing. Now you can begin to see where this story is going to go. All the things which happened to Jesus is the war between light and darkness. And... A classic example of what I'm talking about uh, is there's a story in the Bible in the New Testament where Pontius Pilate brings out two prisoners in in uh, in, in Jerusalem. He brings out the he's the governor of Jerusalem. He's the governor of Judea, and he represents Rome. And he's the governor. And in the Bible it says that. Pontius Pilate brought out before the city, he called a meeting, and all the city was there, and he brought out two prisoners. He had, on the left-hand side, he had Barabbas. Barabbas was known to be a murderer, a liar, and a career criminal. Not a, Nothing of any redeemable value in this criminal. And on the right, he had Jesus, the light of the world. So here is a guy who's dedicated his life to the dark side. It was an evil criminal. While on the other uh, on the other side, you have the truth and the light, Jesus. And so the scripture says that Pontius Pilate said to the crowd in the city, according to the custom of your people, your your custom in Rome, uh, once a year I can release one prisoner to the city. I can let one prisoner go. That's our custom. So. Today, I will release one prisoner, according to our custom. Which one do you want, Barabbas or Jesus? You tell me. It's your custom. You tell me who to release. And the Bible says, the Bible says, with one voice, everyone, with one voice said, give us Barabbas. Nobody in town wanted Jesus. Nobody. Give us Barabbas. That's a spiritual metaphor. That's an encoded message, which is saying, here's the, end of, here's the encoded message in that, is that when the government or power, the authorities representing government or representing power, God, I don't care what you call it, whatever the power is, and when the power of this world presents to the people, you have one of two choices. You have the criminal, or you have the prince of light. You have the truth and the light, or you have a criminal. Which one do you want? Everyone agreed they wanted Barabbas. We want the criminal. We don't want to hear the truth and the light. We're not interested in hearing truth and the light. Why? Because we are democracy. Democracy means we want somebody like us. We're all a bunch of alcoholics, rapists, uh, lawbreakers, fanatics, goofballs, airheads, criminals, stupid, ill-informed, dimwits, self-centered, egotistical. 
So we love Barabbas. He's like us. We can deal with him. But Jesus represented the truth and the light. We're not interested in no truth and light. Period. Give us Barabbas, not the truth and the light. So as I've said to you before, that is true. I have learned that over 50 years of speaking to people around the world, that the one thing that people, generally speaking, do not want, because people will always support what they want. They will not support what they don't want. The one thing people will not support ever is the truth and the light. People, generally speaking, are not interested to look at the real truth. You don't want to look at your wife for who she really is. You don't want to look at your children who are on drugs because they are telling you this is what kind of a parent you were. Your kid's in prison. Your kid's on drugs. Your kid flipped a car and killed somebody. And it all goes back to you. What kind of a parent you were. So you don't want to hear the truth. You don't want to hear that the people in, in your company don't like you. You don't want to hear the truth about you. You want to hear the you want to hear what the Prince of Darkness. So go to the baseball game and the, and the football games and all your silly alcohol and your parties, and bring your beer and your and your pretzels and because now everybody's like you. You know we're a democracy. Everybody's like you. You you are you you're ignorant, ill-informed, unread, dim-witted, religious goofball, bigoted, racist. Well, so is everybody else. So you fit in just fine. Everybody loves you. Unless, of course, you were into the truth and the light. And in that case, nobody wants to hear you. They're not inviting you to any parties. They don't want to hear from anything about you. They don't want to hear this truth and the light. It's a symbolic story. The people always love lies. They are never going to accept the truth and the light. So with one voice, it says, the whole town said to Pontius Pilate, give us Barabbas. We know we can handle him. He's a criminal. Well, so are we. He's one of us. Jesus, he represents the truth and the light. We don't want to hear it. No, thank you. Why? It's because if you were sound asleep and you were very tired and you have been sound asleep and someone slipped into your bedroom at, at 3 o'clock in the morning and flipped on a 600-watt bulb next to your bed, your immediate normal human reaction would be to jump quickly and hide your eyes. Why? Well, because it, first of all, scared the hell out of you. 600 watt bulb, boom, all of a sudden, it woke you up and scared you, but it also hurt your eyes, and you turn away from it and, uh, and cover your eyes because it hurt, hurts your eyes. That's a normal, natural reaction yep. when you're confronted with the truth in the light so therefore, anyone who is extremely bright, that's a word we use in relation to light, as someone really bright, intellectually, spiritually very bright, and they're trying to enlighten you, and you've been in the dark all your life, you don't know what's going on. You've never read nothing. You don't know nothing. You don't understand nothing. You've got nothing. And someone comes into your life who is intellectually or spiritually enlightened, and they're like a 600-watt bulb going off in your face. You've never heard any of this. So the first thing you do when you hear someone who's in the truth and the light, or giving you the truth and the light, you turn your head and, got, and cover your eyes. Because this guy's brilliant. And I've been in the dark all my life, and I don't understand what he's talking about. All I know is the bull, the BS I've been told all my life, and I got a religion. I love the Lord Jesus, and I drink a lot. And, hallelujah. Yeah, and hallelujah, and pass the, and pass the, the booze, and all that stuff. And now I find out that there is no Jesus, and the whole thing was a metaphor, and I'm a fool, and my government's gone, and, uh, and uh, my government's gone, and all of that shit. And so once you understand all of that, it's, it just means you're a fool. You've been deceived. You're in the dark. It's the works of darkness, and you're in the dark, and you cannot deal with the light and the truth. So, when Jesus says of himself, I am, it's, it's a metaphor, it's a symbolic story. Jesus said, I am the truth and the light. No man comes to the Father unless he comes through me. Obviously, 
If you want to actually communicate with the divine principle in heaven called God, I don't know if you're smart enough to do that, or if you're brave enough to do that, but if you actually want to communicate with God, it would be better if you just stay in your little silly-ass religion, because everybody loves you, and you love everybody, and everybody feels good about it, everything. Amen. But if you really want to contact the spirit in the universe, then don't even come to that great divine presence, the great spirit in the universe, with your silly-ass religion. Because if there is a God out there, obviously, if you understand how big the universe really is, and if there is a divine presence in the universe that has created all things in your mind, you're calling it God. Well, if there is a God, don't try and communicate with that God, with your silly-ass religion, with your beer-drinking, silly-ass routine that you're dancing around the stage and singing hymns and falling all over yourself and blessing everybody with, with incense and spreading water on people and giving all that silly bullshit. And then, of course, you're making millions of dollars a year doing it. Don't think you're going to go to the divine presence in the universe that we call God with your silly-ass religion. It ain't going to fly. You're going to talk to God. You better go clean. Because if there is a God out there, and that God is in the position of power that you say he is, then your silly-ass routine ain't going to fly. Because he already knows what you are. So if you want to go to God, you better come back, you better go back and do some homework. If you want to talk to God, the best way you can do it in your silly ass religion is just go to your church and you'll feel much better. Go to your church and talk to God and dance around the stage and sing hymns and light candles, and do all that good stuff, and you feel great. But you're not even getting close to the divine one. So don't even try it. Because if you're, going, if you're going to go actually in fact before the divine presence in the universe that men have called God, then you are not going to go there with your silly religion. Nobody goes to the Father unless he comes through me, the truth and the light. So you better look at yourself in the real light and see what the real truth is before you go talking to God. So nobody comes to God unless he goes through the truth and the light. So if you're going to go to God with your silly-ass religion, stay home. It ain't going to fly. You mean I can't murder someone and just say sorry? Yeah, you could. Sure, if you're in California, you can. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm saying you can't go to God with your silly religion. With your Jewish religion, you're not going to God. You have no idea. All God is is dog spelled backwards. Okay? That's why you have church dogma. So if you're going to go to God, you need to get all that religious stuff out of your head, all that silly church stuff out of your head, all of that man-made, silly-ass, money, corrupt, corporation, big-time money, dancing on the stage and wearing your, uh, wearing your religious clothes and lighting candles and singing hymns. All of that is to make you feel good in a church, which is nothing more than a social organization. If you want to talk to the divine presence in the universe that men have called God, yeah, you have, first of all, better take a couple of courses in astronomy and find out how big this universe really is. And find out how big the universe really is. And if there is somebody out there that's over this universe like God, then you've got to figure he's going to be a lot smarter than you. And he knows your bullshit from a long time ago. So don't go to God with your silly religion. It ain't going to fly. That's like you coming to me to, 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 to look for, a, I'm, I'm the government, you're coming to me for a job. And I'm so impressed you coming to me. What are you kidding? I'm not impressed with you. Hell, I got your, I got your, I got your paperwork right here. You've been in jail three times. You've had six wives. You owe the government money. You've been convicted of four different felonies. And you coming to me for looking for a job? What's, what's wrong with you? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You think I'm stupid enough? I'm going to hire you. Same thing with you going to God. No, I'm going to go to God, and I want to talk to the Lord God. And I want to, Are you kidding? What the hell? With your background, are you going to go to God? Mm -hmm. First of all, you can't even read. Your silly-ass religion is one of the silliest religions on the face of the earth, and you're going to go talk to God. Come on. So 
No man comes to the Father unless he comes through me, the truth and the light. Yeah, the God's Son, the light of the world. The sun represents light, and the darkness represents evil. That's why Jesus is the Prince of Peace, because it gets very peaceful when the sun comes out. Yeah, there could be a storm at night, electrical storm, but when the sun comes out, for all of a sudden it starts, the sun dissipates the storm and it gets peaceful. So he's the Prince of Peace. And then we have the story in the Bible with Jesus in a boat on, on, the, on the sea. And the scripture says in the New Testament story about Jesus, he's in a boat, and it was not the Queen Mary. You know, not, not 700 uh, uh, rooms with dining and elevators. No, it's just a little boat, fishing boat. And it says in the Bible that, the, that a storm came up and that, these, that the guys, the sailors in the boat, who were seasoned sailors. They'd been through everything on this, on this. But the storm was so bad, it says even the seasoned sailors were frightened that they're, they're, they were going to die. That's how bad the storm was. It's a bad storm. Must be a bad one. Because yep. the guys who've been out there all their life, this time they're really scared. So that was really scared because it's a bad storm. And therefore, they said they had to go and wake Jesus up to tell him how bad the storm was. Logic alone would tell you there's a, this is a metaphor. It's a symbolic story. What are you talking about a storm so bad? And we're not talking about on the Queen Mary. We're talking about a little fishing boat. And the damn storm is so bad that the sailors themselves think they're going to die. That's how bad the storm is. And Jesus is sleeping. He didn't know anything about it. Sound asleep. How the hell are you going to be sound asleep when a storm is so bad the sailors are going to, uh, committing suicide? It's so bad. And Jesus is sound asleep. He didn't know anything about it. They had to wake him up. Son of God. <laughs> and then it says, but when he woke up and he rose, uh, he told the storm to quiet. And the storm quieted down. And they said, my goodness, God's son caused the, earth, caused the storm to, to stop. Well, of course, if there's a horrible storm on the sea at night, and that's when the big storms happen is at night, because of the inversion of the heat and the, and the cold air at night, the, the air is rising from the heat of the day, and it hits the cold air, and that's when tornadoes and, 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 uh, and hurricanes and terrible storms at sea. But when the sun comes out, the sun dissipates the, the, the storm, warms the, the atmosphere, and the storm subsides. So when God's sun, who is the light of the world, of course the sun is the light of the world. Our risen Savior. Of course it's your risen Savior. And when there's a horrible storm on the sea, yeah, well, when he rises, the, 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 the storm subsides, it calms down. So they say, oh my, God's, God's son was able to quiet the storm. Of course the sun quiets the storm on the sea. Talking about astro astronomy, the sun heats up the, 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 the atmosphere and the storm dies down. Makes sense. So there's about 40 to 50 different stories in the Bible I'm going to go through, but each one basically will tell you Jesus represents the sun, S-U-N, because English People will tell me all the time because they, they hear this and they say, well, that, but that's using English. That's just in English it works, the S-U-N and S-O-N. I said, no, no, no. English is a German language. It's called Germanic language. Look it up in the encyclopedia, English. English is referred to in the encyclopedia as Low German. It's a German language. It's a Germanic language, English, Low German. And therefore, in German, high German, that thing that comes up in the morning, you know, it brings light into the world? Sun. It's called the sun. But how is it spelled in German? S-O-N. In German, that thing that comes up every morning and brings light into the world is spelled S-O-N, sun. And therefore, we, in low English, changed it. And we say it's S-U-N. 
and therefore your boy, who is your offspring, is your son. Why? Because he is the light of your life. Your, your whole life is in your son. And so when the people see your son, whatever anyone does to your son, they've done it to you. The idea is whatever you do to my son, you've done it to me. If you treat my son with respect and honor, then you have treated me with respect and honor. You mess with my son, you've messed with me. He's my son, and what you did to him, you did it to me. He can't pay you back, but I can. So, that's why Jesus is referred to as God's son, the light of the world. So, the idea is, and we can, we can probably end it now with this last and final comment, uh, that Jesus represents the son, the S-U-N, the light of the world our risen Savior. Of course the sun is your risen Savior. If it doesn't rise in the morning, we're dead in about three weeks. Therefore, the sun represents, in the ancient prehistoric world, the sun represented the truth and the light. Because at night time, if you see someone doing something, you can't swear by it, because it was dark at night and you can't swear. But if it was in broad daylight. Now you know the truth because you saw it in broad daylight. So therefore the, the prince of darkness is evil. Put a D in front of the word evil becomes devil, prince of darkness. While God's son is the light of the world, he is the truth and the light. All makes sense. Well, whoever did write the uh, Bible is quite clever. Very clever. The Ten Commandments. And if you're living by the Ten Commandments strictly. Well, it's very clever. You're, you're a good man. Yeah. But remember, in the Ten Commandments, the first commandment was, I am the Lord your God. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. That's a whole subject right there in itself. That's a two-hour subject right there. Well, right there, I, I don't like it. Yeah, because because uh, because the Ten Commandments, first of all, there was two sets of the Ten Commandments. There was the first set of Ten Commandments, which Moses came down from the mountain Sinai and saw the, the Hebrew people, his people, dancing around the golden calf. Now, that's a whole subject. And he got so upset with the Hebrew people, the Bible says he threw down and broke the law. So that's where we get, in our, in our terminology, someone has broke the law. Why? Because that's what Moses did. He threw down the tablets of the law and they broke. So he broke the law. So he was the first lawbreaker. Then God gave him a second Ten Commandments, which were different. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So he had to go back up there and do it again. And God gave him a different Ten Commandments this time. I wonder what the first ones were. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> Very interesting. The first Ten Commandments, you will never know because the scripture says it, well, he broke the law. He threw down the Ten Commandments and broke them. And so the second Ten Commandments is in the Bible. That's the second set. <laughs> and I think it's interesting that the first uh, commandment is thou shalt, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. It doesn't say, God was not saying to, to Moses, I am the only God in the whole universe. No. Read it, what it says. And this comes from a very high-ranking rabbi I talked to back in 1960, over 50 years ago. The rabbi sat for hours, and I used to sit and talk and he was a very high-ranking rabbi in America. And I talked to him for 1960, and he said, it's, read it what it says. Don't read into it. Read it. It says the first commandment is, I am the Lord your God. I'm not the only God. I'm the Lord your God. And I will not have strange gods before me. He didn't say he was the only God in the whole universe. No, obviously, he's not the whole God of the whole universe. He said, I am the Lord, your God, saying to Israel, saying to the Jews, I am your God. And so, therefore, we know and uh, I will not have strange gods before me, which is the same thing when you're getting married or you've got it, you're going steady with a girl. 
You say, I am your steady. I'm not the only guy in the world, no, but I'm the only one in your life. Let's get that straight. There's lots of other guys out there better than me, but I'm the one in your life. So I don't want to have any other guys, you know, coming Creep, around. Creeping around. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So let's just get it straight, who the boss is here. I'm not the only God, but I'm the only one in your life, period. So therefore, God's saying to the, the Israelites, I am the Lord your God. And I will not have strange gods before me. Now, you can mess around with the gods later on behind me, but they better not have any before me. So you can have a lot of men friends if you want. But when it comes to personal stuff, just me. I don't care if you have boyfriends at work and you have other people, all the guys you know. Yeah, but I am the Lord, your God, and I will not have any other strange gods before me. So therefore, we find out that the Hebrews, the Jewish people, were not monotheistic people. It's called monotheistic. We're told that the Jews were the first monotheistic people, which is ludicrous on the face of it. The Hebrews and the Jewish people were not monotheistic. They were never monotheistic, and they're not monotheistic today. Period. They're not monotheistic. They are heno. The word is H-E-N-O. Go look it up in a dictionary. H-E-N-O. Henotheistic. Theistic means of God. Mono means one. So we're told that the Hebrews were the worshipers of one God. They were monotheistic. No, they weren't. They were henotheistic. Rabbi, the rabbi told me many years ago, the Hebrews were never a monotheistic. They're not monotheistic today, and they ain't never going to be monotheistic. Ain't never been monotheistic. Mono means the worship of gun God. Well, there God said, I am the Lord your God. And I will not allow any other gods before me. He didn't say there was no other gods. Just don't have any other gods in front of me. I'm the first one. So you can have all the other men in your life that you work with and you, you know, you, you, you friends with. That's fine. As long as you remember, there's only one guy in your life. You talking to him, all right? So I am the Lord your God, and you and I shall not have strange gods before me. So don't bring any gods in this house before me. So therefore, he didn't say there were no other gods. No, I'm just there is no other gods for you. You made a contract with me. So therefore, you understand that the the Hebrew people were heno theistic, not mono. Theistic. They were not the worshipers of one God. So, to explain this, let's say that there were 16 different gods, and all 16 were equal. And you were asked to pick one. Pick one, one of those gods to, you'll be his follower and he'll be your God. And you make a deal with him, or a covenant, or a contract, or a covenant, like an Ark of the Covenant. It's a contract. So, therefore, you pick that one God that you like in the blue suit. That's the one you pick. That's the one. Okay. So, now he is the Lord, your God. Right. Okay. But there's 15 others. So, what about the other 15? Well, the, your God says to you, I am the Lord, your God. But I will not have these other gods before me. I mean, I don't care if they're here, but not in your life. <laughs> so, pick one. Yeah. So, pick, pick one, one and go with it. Pick one and go with it. Better make the right choice first time out. Well, that's that's the part. You know, it's not your fault if you make the wrong choice. Well, no. Some I mean, people it's just only have you. one choice. Look at that's why I've always said knowledge is power. That's why the American people don't have any power to do anything. They have no knowledge. That's why religious people have no no prerogatives in their life at all. They don't have any choice to say anything. Why? Because you don't know nothing. Knowledge is power. Without knowledge, you have no power. So, therefore, Christians are praying to God continually every day, and the more they pray to protect their homeland, to protect their lives, to protect their family, uh, the more they pray to protect the church, whatever you're praying for, whatever it is the Christians are praying for, it ain't working. Because by their fruits, you shall know them.
What is the fruitage of the Christians, all millions of them, or one billion of them, all over the earth praying to God? What is the fruitage of Christianity praying to God? Well, what is the fruitage of the Jews praying to their God that they picked? Well, I don't know. What is the fruitage of the Islamic people praying what? to their God? What is the fruitage? Want an answer? What would you say? The fruitage of all three of the people of the book, all the gods that they're worshiping and praying to? Am I being graded on this? Uh, no. I'm going to let you go <laughs> let you slide. Ignorance. Yeah, ignorance. So I, I passed. And war, violence, drugs, gang wars, drive-by shootings, alcohol, drug wars, Bedellin cartels, international conflicts, rape, plunder, pornography. The whole world is falling apart with corruption, evil, murder, violence, women and children being raped and murdered, young, young kids, you know, teenagers killing 30 and 40 people at a time. Hey, they were born and raised in a country with Christians and Jews. There's your, there's the, there is a classic example. By their fruits you shall know them. What is the fruitage of America if it isn't drive-by shootings, alcoholism, drug addiction, murder, violence, war, pornography, Bugs Bunny, Big Top Pee Wee, Hulkamania, uh, uh, you know, war fighting, cage fighting, martial arts, war, jets, flipping cars, drugs, the whole entire civilization and the Western world, what is the fruitage of your God? Are we being judged as a civilization? Oh, I hope not. Because if there is a divine presence in the universe that we call God, if there is, um, you're not going to be able to fool that one with your BS. I mean, you can fool other people. You can fool some of the people some of the time, and you can fool all the people some of the time, but you can't fool God ever, period. That and, stands to reason. Yeah. So therefore, you can think about yourself as being holy and righteous and a wonderful America, America, land of the free and home of the brave, and how wonderful and holy you are, and how wonderful our country is. You're not wonderful. You're not wonderful at all. Your homeland is filled with hypocrisy, uh, corruption, violence. Your government is a communist, Nazi, fascist, dictatorship. Your banks are corrupt. Your educational, uh, educational institutions are corrupt. Your military is corrupt. Your money is worthless. Your children are criminals. The entire so, uh, civilization and the Western civilization is crumbling and falling apart like the Roman Empire. Why? Because you're worshiping the wrong God. What you're doing is you're worshiping the God of your forefathers who they didn't know any more about than you do. So you don't understand what you're doing. You're worshiping a God that you do not know. And that's why by their fruits you shall know them. What is the fruitage of Christianity and Judaism if it isn't Middle Eastern war, white slavery, pornography, drug addiction, wars, murder, gang wars, motorcycle gangs? That is the fruitage of Judaism and Christianity. It's on the streets of America. It's on the streets of the big cities of the world. That's the fruitage. So don't tell me about how holy and righteous you are. No man comes to the Father unless he comes through me, the truth and the light. That's just the beginning of a story that is a very old story in the world. It's called astrotheology. Before you make a judgment on this story, listen to the rest of it before you go deciding what you think about what I'm saying. You need to at least hear the whole story before you judge it. To be able to do a quality show, 